All right, we're in 1 John chapter 3, or chapter 2, I should say. 1 John chapter 2, verse 21 is where we will pick up. <clears throat> Let's begin by reading the entirety of the section once again, verses 18 through the end of the chapter in verse 29. He says, children, it is the last hour, as you have heard, that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have all knowledge. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father, and whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing you have received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his, anoint as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true, and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. All right, so in this uh, chapter, we've been dealing with a couple of different things. Uh, and in this particular section, he is giving them warnings. And uh, we spent a couple of class sessions in extended discussion about <clears throat> uh, some of the words here. And many times the challenges are removing the, the false notions um, that exist in our own minds. And... Um, <clears throat> just kind of going back to the text and forgetting uh, some of the, the wild teachings and all of the connections that some people want to make from these texts and really just beginning with the text and then being responsible in how we handle um, taking one passage from one book and tying it to another passage from another book. Um, to do that responsibly is something that's very important. Okay, Anybody can... You know, you can look at a word and say, well, I found this word over here, so it must have relation to this over here. Well, they're two completely different letters, okay? It, I'm not saying that they don't have relation to each other. I'm saying but it would be a problem to assume that automatically they're directly related to each other because they share the same word. I mean, you could take the word the and be like, well, all these books are connected because you have the word the in them. Well, maybe, but that's not solid evidence, okay? So we have to learn how to <clears throat> handle these things responsibly. And so what he's telling them to do is to avoid. And there, is, there are a group of false teachers that have arisen. Um, <clears throat> it will eventually become what church history calls Gnosticism, um, they, a denial of the deity of Jesus and the humanity of Jesus uh, in both ways. Both of them are actually a denial of the deity of Jesus, that is the fact that he is God. Um, one of them denies also that he came in the flesh, but both of them are assaults on his divine character. And that's what John is primarily dealing with in this region of Ephesus where he is writing. Okay? In the region of Ephesus and these churches where he is writing. So, where we pick up, um, he said, children, it's the last hour as you have heard that Antichrist is coming. We talked about Antichrist at length last week. Um, <clears throat> and so the idea behind Antichrist is not some individual great figure at the end of time the word itself just means to stand against Christ or someone who's trying to stand up in behalf of Christ that is someone who's trying to subvert him okay so <clears throat> the word itself means to stand against the one that God has chosen his anointed and then he goes on to say and now many antichrists so now many antichrists have come therefore we know it is the last hour we talked about it being the final stage of of God's plan for the history of the world. Uh, you can't have an antichrist in the um, patriarchy because you don't have a Christ. You can't have an antichrist in the Jewish dispensation because you don't have a Christ. Okay, So the presence of antichrists 
presume upon the fact that the Christ has appeared. God's chosen one has appeared. And so what he's saying is the fact that there are antichrists that exist prove that we're in the final stage. God has made his appointed one, his chosen one known. And these individuals are laying or, or, or hurling assaults at him and his identity. And so he says, <clears throat> they went out from us, these teachers, <clears throat> but they were not of us. No genuine conversion in them. And it might become plain that they are not of us, but we, you have been anointed by the Holy One and you have all knowledge. And uh, this is where we left off last week. Uh, there are <clears throat> multiple ideas here. The one that I think that makes the most sense in my mind, everybody must make up their own. But the one that makes the most sense in my mind, the anointing from the Holy One, the Holy One is most likely, it's, a refer it's obviously a reference to God, to which member of the Godhead we've, we've looked. You can look in Old and New Testaments, Father, Son, and Spirit are all referred to with this terminology. So either way, God gives an anointing, okay, which is very similar. It's a word play on the term Christ. Uh, it's charisma. We get our English word charisma from it. <clears throat> Uh, to me, the most likely explanation is that we're dealing with the first century times. Miraculous gifts are still available. The only way miraculous gifts are transferred, as far as we can see from the pages of the New Testament, are through the hands of an apostle. Well, John is an apostle. His ability to transfer miraculous gifts would have been very real. And so... Um, <clears throat> This has to do, I think this, ha this speaks clearly to the fact that they, they know all things, okay? You're dealing with a generation of Christians who didn't have a completed, uh, what has come to be known, a completed canon. That is, uh, the text of Scripture was not fully completed. It wasn't compiled. Many of them would never own them in, a, in, a, in the totality of it. That's, that's a rather new thing that's happened. Uh, in the history of the world, <clears throat> really since the, the printing press, uh, the typeset of the print press, anyway. And so, how did they function, especially in that early century? Well, miraculous gifts enabled them. They had to know. Um, and that was, and you have the gifts enumerated in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and one of them is knowledge. The ability to understand that. And there's a checks and balance system that God had built into those gifts. You didn't just have one person with knowledge, you also had another person who had the gift of discerning spirits who could tell whether or not what they were saying was true, whether they were sincere, whether they were legitimate. And so you had um, <clears throat> a number of things that were going on. And so that seems to be the most likely explanation. But that then leads us then uh, to verse 21 when he says, I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. And so what he's saying to them is, I mean, it's, it's as plain as he's written it. He says it negatively and positively. I'm not writing to you because you don't know it. I'm writing to you because you know it. You know this, okay? And it reminds us of the, um, <clears throat> I forget who it was, the old uh, axiom that says, most often people need to be reminded more than they need to be informed. A lot of times... The answer is many times something we've learned a long time ago. We just need to be reminded of that. We just need to push it to the front of their, to the front of our brains and to the front of the brains of other people, and, and to remind them to function that way. And that's what even Peter said in Second Peter chapter three when he's dealing with a similar situation. He said, "Look, I'm just trying to stir up your minds by way of remembrance. Remember what you have been taught." Okay. And so if there's this body of truth that's been deposited into an individual through a lifetime of learning or through a lifetime of being raised a certain way, then many times you can look at them and you can say, do you remember this? You remember when we learned this? Here we go. Here it is. Okay, there are a lot of things... Um, as parents we do for our kids and we're teaching them on multiple levels they don't know that we do they don't we're teaching them things at a young age <clears throat> that at some point when the, as they progress older we will be able to take that simple lesson we taught them as a child and at every step of their development say do you remember this this is how it applies to your situation now 
And then as they get older and another situation arises, do you remember what you were taught here? This informs that. Okay? Everything operates around this body of principles. Okay? And so learning how to uh, navigate using those principles is is important and I would say with a lot of people a lot of times we're really trying to complicate issues that don't need to be complicated just think okay <clears throat> last week when we talked about Antichrist one of the things that we did was we said okay let's forget all the other stuff we've heard and all the crazy notions that exist out there and let's just start at the most fundamental element. And the most fundamental element is to do what? Define the word. Define the word. Okay? Go back to what you know. Don't overcomplicate it. Stick with what you know. And build. And reason from, reason out of Scripture. Okay? Not taking ideas that people have, but actually start building the case and see if then the case holds up. And that's what he's telling them here. You know this. This is not something. No lie is of the truth. What they're saying is inconsistent. What they're saying about Jesus is totally inconsistent with what you know. In verse 22 he says, <clears throat> Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. They're speaking against Christ. They're standing against Christ. They're saying he's not God. Okay? <laughs> well, what's the very foundation of Christianity? Jesus is God. I mean, if he's not, then everything about it is wrong. If that truth is undermined, then nothing else really matters. That's a, there are several bedrock truths in Christianity that if, if look, <clears throat> this is something that uh, when I'm evaluating someone's critique of Christianity, one of the things I'm looking at is, are you dealing with all these peripheral issues or are you really coming at the heart of it? Because if you're dealing with all these peripheral issues that exist, you know what you're telling me? you know deep down you have no case against the heart of Christianity. Because Christianity is built upon certain fundamental facts that, you know what, if you want to undermine something, if you want to prove something to be false, don't deal with all the tentacles out here. Go straight to the heart and just put an end to it. That's the way you handle it. You want to put an end to Christianity? Then prove that Jesus isn't God. That would end it. In Acts chapter 2, when, <clears throat> when the first gospel sermon is being preached, centered around the resurrection of Christ, which is one of the main claims of Christianity that proves that he is God, what was one thing they could have done is shut the whole thing down before it ever got started. That's it. We can prove it right now it's not true. Here's his body. All you, that's all they'd had to do to shut it down. Make an argument somewhere along the way that it doesn't make that that this whole thing collapses. That's all you have to do. And so, <clears throat> when he is walking through this with them, this is what Antichrist is doing. Antichrist is going straight to the heart of the matter. Now, obviously, I don't agree <laughs> with individuals, these teachers, and what they were saying about Jesus, but at least they kind of understood something. They were simply trying to take, and what they were having trouble with was they were trying to blend their philosophical worldview with religion. And the second, you know, you start talking philosophy, that's when everybody's like, oh boy. Hey, philosophy is not, I mean, yes, there are some philosophers that are, think they're highfalutin and all of this matter, okay. But philosophy is just a love of wisdom. Every person has a philosophy. You don't call it that. You have a philosophy. 
you have a philosophy for everything. And you don't, many times, don't even know why you have it. Okay? We are all affected and impacted by our culture. All of us. Okay? So when a person stands up and claims, I can set aside all of the biases of my culture, that person is not living in reality. We are affected by our culture, like it or not. Okay? And we have to be able to... <laughs> it's going to start a train here in just a second. It's happened before. The... Um, <clears throat> The danger is <clears throat> keeping my cultural assumptions from coloring how I understand what God says. That's the real challenge. They had philosophical assumptions that we talked about in the very beginning of this study when we introduced who they were. Their philosophical assumptions dealt with that all physical matter was evil. And therefore, Jesus could not be God and also come and put on flesh and be matter. That was their assumption. They're marrying their assumption to a religious claim. Am I right? The problem was their philosophical assumption that their culture uh, put forward for them, it was wrong. Matter is not evil. Matter is actually just amoral. It's not really good or bad. It's just there. So <clears throat> we have to be cautious because a number of interpretations arise in Scripture uh, of people out of Scripture because they're assuming something and they're running with that assumption into scripture and that begins to say well no it couldn't mean that well why not and I think we used <clears throat> this example once in Luke 9 at the end of Luke 9 like 52 to and that may be a little or maybe 57 to 62 or something like that um, <clears throat> you know you've got these three individuals who interact with Jesus who he Jesus calls a couple to follow him and another asks to follow him and all of them are basically turned away Good. 